Hey everyone, I think we're live. It says we're live. So, uh, if you're new to the channel, my everyone, my name is Doug. I run a company in Ormy Talk called Doug Johnson Productions. We do live event video production, so sporting events, business conferences, uh, concerts, those kinds of things. So, um, anyway, this is a live Q and A. So, the content in this video is really going to be t be determined by the people that are watching. So, if you have questions, please leave your question down in the chat. And uh, I'll try and try as best I can to answer them. So um, looks like uh, we've got a couple of people there in the chat that are that are watching. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please be, be sh uh, sure to just fire those off. So for the first thing I want to mention here is that uh, you probably noticed there's been fewer videos from me here uh, this so far this year in 2019. And the main reason for that is just I've just been busy. I've had a lot going on. So uh, I've had probably kind of the average number of video productions going on, but with my, with my crew access website that I've been spending a lot of time on, that's eating up a significant portion of my time. So, yeah. Um, let's see. So, hello, everyone. It's, always, it's uh, good to see people from around the world. Always good to see that. Uh, I intentionally scheduled this, this stream this time in the morning for me so that it would be accessible to people in Europe. So... Uh, looks like the first question there is, hi, how are you? I'm doing very well. Thanks for asking. Uh, again, mentioned I'm staying very, very busy. I am putting a lot of time into my Crew Access website. So if you haven't taken a look at that, please do. It's crewaxis.com, C-R-E-W-A-X-I-S. And it's a site that's really designed to help with all aspects of video pr running a video production business. And over time, it's going to be... Uh, Diversifying a little bit and to, in, to include additional types of businesses as well. Uh, so we'll see where it goes, but uh, I've got kind of a roadmap for a bunch of features coming up in the future. So um, yeah, we'll see we'll see where it goes. So uh, looks like we have a uh, comment here from Eric uh, Wildeman about these biodynamic DT108 109. These guys back here. But the impedance is, is so high that we can't hear each other at all during events. Uh, is there a solution? Uh, there is a solution. Um, I can't remember the name of the device or who makes it, but there is a device that basically acts as a small headphone amplifier. Th those headsets do have very, very high impedances. And in order to get something like a camera or a Blackmagic camera, camera converter to drive those, you really do need to go through a headphone amplifier. Um, I, I really can't remember the name of the one that I saw, but it's battery powered, so you basically take the output, headphone output of the camera converter or whatever you're using, run that into the input of the, of the headphone amplifier, and then you can plug your bi biodynamic right into that. I wish I have, I wish I had, I wish I could remember what the actual, um, what the actual, uh, name of the product was and who made it, who made it, but unfortunately, I mean, if, if you look around and I bet if you look, you go to the Black Magic forums, and were to search there, you probably find somebody referring to it there. That may have been where I seen it mentioned. So, okay, all right. Next question: So Tinder asking if I have any experience with logging ATEM to EDL logging. Um, I personally do not. Um, it, there's another channel here on YouTube. A guy named John Barker who runs a channel called Here to Record. He's actually developing an application that kind of helps with that. It's not an automatic process. Basically, you use your phone to say, I'm switching, switching to camera one, I'm switching to camera two. And at the end of your event, it'll create an EDL for you. Um, there's some possibility that if I've got time, I may develop something in the future that automatically logs from the ATEM switchers. Uh, it shouldn't be too hard to do, but... Uh, yeah, we'll see. I just, I, I've got so many other things on my plate. I've, there's a very good chance I'll never get to it. So, okay, Matthew, how can I import videos during a broadcast? All right, so <laughs> there's a ton of different ways to handle uh, videos in a live situation. So a number of people out there are using like the Blackmagic HyperDeck products in order to do video playback, especially because if you're using an ATEM switcher, they can integrate and you can actually have it automatically trigger playback on the deck when you switch to that source. Uh, so there's that's one way to do it. Uh, the settings for your video encoder there can be a little bit finicky. I've had the best luck, luck using ProRes doing that. Uh, not quite as much luck using DNX or DN, uh, DNX HD or DN, DNX HR. Uh, but 
it, it, it does work. So uh, if you go to export a video from out, out of your video editing software and, and code it in ProRes at the appropriate frame rate and resolution, you should be able to play it back from the HyperDeck directly into your switcher. Uh, the other thing people do is just use a computer. Uh, um, personally, what I do more often than not is I just play it directly off the Premiere timeline. I have a Blackmagic Ultra Studio 4K device that connects to a computer over a Firewire. And basically, anything I play out of the timeline in, in Premiere, it just goes out the output, SDI output of the Ultra Studio, and that goes directly into my switcher. Um, so that's another possibility. Uh, Casper CG is another one. Uh, let's see, there's uh, v VMix has a solution, I believe. There's a whole bunch of them. There's all, all sorts of ways of doing it. I've even heard of people, a lot of people just doing something like using uh, VLC on, on a computer and taking the out HDM output of their computer. So all sorts of different possibilities. So let's see, next question. Radovan, as I, guess, I hope that's how you say your name. Um, how would you recommend... How would you... <laughs> Would you recommend uh, some streaming platform with paywall? Uh, that's a that's a that's a tricky one. Um, I haven't found a great solution for that. For typically, what my clients have done, uh, we've there's a couple. Yeah, what we what we've typically done is just used YouTube and then uh, an unlisted link. The downside to that, of course, is that any, if somebody shares the link, then anybody can get to it. Uh, Vimeo does have a solution. Um, Vimeo has some restriction does have some features where you can restrict who can who can who can see things so basically what you do is you drop a web a web page around the vimeo site and it, it doesn't really take any 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 skill as a web developer in order to put that together you're basically just embedding the vid vimeo video source inside of a web page and then you just basically password protect that web page so um that may be one of the solutions that i offer on my crew access website in the future i'm, I'm kind of looking into that uh it wouldn't be too hard for me to do, and yeah. So there, basically, if, if you sign up for the site, that, that's a service I probably will be making available in the next month, maybe two months. So, anyways, there, there's, there's that option. Okay, looks like I need to scroll back up a little bit. You guys are coming coming in questions faster than I can answer them. Okay, so Tinder, what's the fastest way to go from SD card on play, to playback on a switcher? Uh, having a Roman camera and event capturing clips and playing them back. Um, I don't, I don't know. That's necessarily the fastest way, but just plug it into a computer, and then you can play with using VLC or something like that. So, um, that's probably about as fast as you're gonna get. Uh, so, and then Satinder were commenting on John Barker's logging application. So, okay, so Sundar, which for live broadcast, which Wi-Fi Cat Six hotspot model is best? Um, gosh. I don't have a lot of experience with a lot of those things. I've kind of landed on my own solutions for that for stuff, and yeah, um, I, I don't I don't have a great answer for that, unfortunately. Uh, if you want to contact me in email, you can go to my website uh, djprod.biz. Go to the contact page, and I, and I can probably elaborate a little bit further on that. Okay, Tom Sykes, has the van lived up to all your expectations in terms of paid work? Uh, Yes and no. In terms of technical capability, it has been absolutely awesome. It saves more time than I can possibly uh, than I ever would have possibly imagined. It's been uh, just absolutely fantastic to have. Um, the disappointing thing is that there are a number of events that we've done where I'm not able to use the trailer, uh, just because sometimes it's not possible to run fiber from from the parking lot into where we're going to be, uh, or uh, the distance is too too far. Um, one of the events that I have regularly is on the fifth floor of a building, and there's just no way to get a cable up there. So in that, in those cases, I have to come up with another solution. Um, so, okay, see. Say so Josh commenting on the, the Behringer Power Play, a P1. Yeah, that, that is one that would work. Um, that, that, that's not the one, that's not, that's not one specifically designed for, for the uh, biodynamic headsets, but it would work. Um, may not be as loud as you want, but... Okay, so so Tinder, I need to send a camera feed from a rooftop to a to a ballroom. It's about a thousand feet. I want to have multiple cameras on the roof, so that I should have a mixer on top and send program down via fiber. That's uh, you can either do a mixer or a, a routing switcher. A routing switcher would work too. Um, either way, and say so Tom commenting on Vimeo not offering live paid streaming, only on demand. They they do have live streaming. One of the, one of the people I work with. Um, regularly 
they use Vimeo to live stream events paid and it's paid. They do it all the time. So I, I know that's absolutely possible. And one of my previous jobs, we used Vimeo for, uh, for training videos and we occasionally did some live stuff there. So, uh, Chris, are you, or do you plan to run redundant switchers in the trailer? Uh, I am not currently running redundant switchers. It would be nice to be able to do that. Um, The problem is tr trying to connect up two at a time. Like I'm already absolutely maxed out on both of my 40 channel uh, routing switchers. So there isn't really a great way to, to hook up two in parallel. Um, especially when you're dealing with a 20 input switcher. Th that's a lot of inputs. Um, I do have a Television Studio HD. Um, in a pinch, I can use. I, I have a patch panel in in my trailer, and I could I could patch the outputs of my routing switchers into that if I absolutely had to. Uh, the 2ME version of the Production Studio switcher that I use it has redundant power supplies. It's designed to be more fault tolerant. Eric asking how the forum is coming along. I haven't had any time to work on it, just to be quite frank. All right, so Tinder, do you pl please make a video about your mo um, MoFi and the live streaming gear via cellular. I can, I can certainly do that. So, all right, and then here to record, and it's John. Hey, John. Just popping in to say hi and good luck with the stream. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, next question. I have a weird issue with BMD HyperDeck Studio Go. Uh, Studio Pro, the SSDs after formatting and recording, it doesn't work on Windows. Works perfectly on Mac. Um, which file format are you using? Uh, if you want to be able to play it back on Windows, you would probably want to format in in uh, uh, yeah in, in XFAT. So, okay. So uh, here, record question: Do you have any experience with a paywall or pay, pay per view for live streaming? I I personally don't, but like I say, I I've, I I work with I work with a guy who does. Um, we're very closely with him. Uh, he runs a company called Blitz Entertainment, B-L-I-T-Z-Z, -Z, and they stream, uh, well, they, they've been focusing on mixed martial art, arts events, they do them about once a month, and they live stream in those, and they use they use Vimeo, and they have a paywall in front of theirs. Uh, the paywall is on their own website, it's not with Vimeo, um, so, okay, let's see. So Sundar asking why Teradek Video Pro Video Pro boot time is so slow. I don't know. It, it's probably just a slow processor, to be honest. Uh, th those devices don't have to have very fast processors. So all the video encoding is actually had it handled by dedicated, dedicated uh, hardware. So the c CPU itself, the general purpose CPU, can be quite slow. So, okay. Let's see. Tom, getting some very weird interfer interface on your. When weird noise on the screen. Okay, okay. I, I don't know what's going on. Uh, it could be the fact that I'm actually uh, switching this in 4K and the video is a little bit unpredictable when it's sent a 4K signal. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay. So yeah. So it is on XFAT. Yeah. That that should be about the only requirement uh, for for a video to record. Um, yeah, to record on on an SSD that you can use on Windows. I've never had that issue. I could, they've always always worked for me, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going on there. Noise is back. Let me, let me double check that my 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 mixer should be. I have all the other inputs muted, but let me check. Yeah, everything on the mixer looks fine. I think, I think whatever noise you're hearing is probably an artifact of the live stream, or uh, yeah. So Aaron mentions there's a lot of good options for paywall here in the U.S. And if Aaron, if you wanted to chime in and, and let let us know some of the ones that you're familiar with, like I don't have a lot of experience with that. We've always just I've always just used YouTube for my own stuff because uh, it's just easy. People are familiar with it. There's no learning curve. Um, again, though, I may be doing some feature on my website um, to make that a little easier. So. Um, Satinder asking what I look forward to at NAB this year. Uh, I am planning on being there. Uh, 
probably Monday, Tuesday. We'll see. I usually spend about a day and a half there. I have to, after that, I, I'm able to see pretty much everything I want to about a day, a day and a half. And by that, my, by that time, my feet are killing me. And I want to, I want to get back, back home anyway. Um, so, I don't. I'm not sure what to expect. I, I'm sure we're going to see a lot more 4K, a lot more 8K stuff. Probably a lot of HDR. Um, I, I, I could have some. I could mention some wish uh, items that I have. Uh, I'd like to see a few, a few things from Black Magic. I'd like to see, for example, I'd like to see their uh, their high end switcher have uh, built in scalers. Have uh, be added built in scalers. Um, I'd like to see a new camera converter. I don't think that's going to happen, uh, but I, I'd like that. And I'd also really like to see some new uh, rack mount monitors from Black Magic. Their existing Smart View Duo and Smart Scope Duo the LCDs are pretty lousy. Um, so and I, I like to see all those things updated. Um, in terms of the other companies I work with or whose products I use, Sony, I'm sure they'll come out with new cameras. They do every year. I don't think they're going to be replacing the Z150 or the, the Z90 or the, of course not the Z190 or Z280. Those are those are new from last year, but uh, um, yeah, who knows? Okay, Sundar asking if there's any good 4K streaming device. Uh, there are some out there. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time looking for them. Mostly because none of the places I go have the bandwidth to stream in 4K. 4K just soaks up so much bandwidth, uh, even when you go to H.265. Um, I have enough trouble trying to get 1080p. I usually have to, like this stream right here, this is, this is 720p. Uh, I have enough trouble getting enough bandwidth everywhere I go in order to even get 1080p. So 4K is generally not going to be an option. Um, so Okay, so... Okay, asking if a camera has Ustream, is that helpful? Uh, if it's, it's helpful if you want to stream to Ustream, but uh, other services, if unless it specifically supports those, it's not really going to be a very useful feature. Uh, I think it's the, uh, like for example, the Sony Z90, I believe, has Ustream built in, but it, the only other service, only other thing that it can stream to is Sony's own proprietary system. Uh, so if you're trying, to, if you're trying to go something like a YouTube or Facebook or Vimeo or one of those that that feature isn't isn't helpful at all. So, all right. Um, so yeah, a couple other comments about the stream being noisy, which seems odd. It's like all the settings are pretty much the same as they've been in the past. The, vi the video encoding looks good. The output of the, s the switcher looks good. I'm not sure. All right. Okay, so Squire Player, with your portable setup, how do you power everything? Are you using multiple power strips to plug everything in? Um, I guess it depends on what I'm doing. Like my portable video rack that I just did a video on a couple of days ago, uh, that doesn't draw very much power at all. So I can run that and like pretty much all the other equipment that might be sitting on the same table off of a, off a single outlet. And I, use, I do use power strips, but I try to use nicer ones that... Uh, have built-in um, surge protection and some other some other uh, features to clean up the power a little bit. Uh, occasionally, I'll use UPSs. Although I found out from from Black Magic a couple years ago, they don't like their equipment being plugged into UPSs. So I've I've stopped doing that. But um, yeah. So yeah, but powering the portable stuff has not been a problem. The pa the trailer it can be a potential issue. The trailer requires two dedicated AC circuits. Uh, 15 amps, 110 volt, 15 amps, uh, one for the air conditioner, one for all the electronics. Um, so that has, I've always been able to, to handle that, but there's been a number of times where people just don't know how their building is wired. And so we're having to test outlets to see which ones are on certain circuits, and that can be very time consuming. So, okay, let's see where we are. So Tinder, I need to stream a parade where for three hours it's indoors and then parade moves out for about four hours. How can I transport the mixer without killing the feed? Uh, if the distance is short enough, I'd keep the mixer in one place and then just run cables. Uh, if it's more than that, ugh, I don't know, I'm not sure how you would handle that. Um, that's going to be tricky. You'd have to have, you'd have to be able to feed both video from both locations into one single source. 
so you don't have interruption. Um, maybe a small switcher somewhere in between. I don't know. That's that's a, that's a tricky one. I don't have a great great solution for that one. Okay, Georgie, is it advisable for me to start something like you in my place? I am young, do a lot of streaming for church. Uh, well, it depends on whether you think you can come up with customers. Uh, you know, the live streaming, there aren't a lot of people doing it, but it doesn't take very many to generally meet the needs of any given, any given geographic location. So if you do some research and find that the market's already saturated, you may have difficulty breaking in. Uh, if you're willing to do, I suppose if you're starting out, you're probably going to be doing smaller events anyway. Um, those are a little easier to come by. There's a lot more of the smaller ones. Uh, but, you, but you really need to start with a customer base. Um, I mean, you can start out with, uh, in terms of equipment, you can start out with a couple of cameras and a small switcher, uh, probably a video encoder, uh, an audio mixer. Um, but uh, it really is based on how many other people are in the business and whether you feel up to com trying to compete with the people that are already there. And the other solution is to try and work with them. Uh, and when you're first starting out, maybe it may be better to go and work for somebody else and get some experience and learn what works, what doesn't work, uh, and go from there. So I certainly wouldn't recommend that you try and steal clients, but you can certainly get experience by uh, doing that. So, All right. Um, Okay, Aaron, Daycast and InPlay are two of the more premium options for paywall. Okay, awesome, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, so, is that Cujo or Cujo? Uh, I only use one 15-amp circuit for the whole trailer. Yes. So, as I was building the trailer, not only did I have my money budget, I also had a power budget. So, as I was selecting all the equipment that I needed, I'd add, I'd add in the amount of power that it could, would possibly consume. And when all is said and done, I was able to keep all of the electronics in the trailer under 1500 watts, which is well within the capabilities of a 15 amp circuit. So I've done some testing where a more typical setup, like that, that 1500 watts is ev ev absolutely everything turned on. Um, I've done a, a fair amount of testing where I turn on basically the more typical amount of equipment that I use and power consumption in those situations is usually more like seven to 800 watts. And so I could run off. I could even run this, that stuff off of a small generator. So that was mostly made possible by the fact that I selected very power efficient monitors. So there's 18 different monitors here in the trailer, and I made sure that I was select all of them are LED backlights, so that helps a lot with power. But the other thing I did is I, I turned down the brightness on them. I, you don't need super super bright monitors on a light uh, in an environment where the light's controlled. So. <coughs> uh, turn the brightness down on the monitors a bit, and that keeps the power consumption way, way, way down. So, okay, I'm gonna scroll back up. I'm getting behind. What software do you use for providing program graphics? Most of the time, I use my own software. I wrote some software 15 years ago for uh, one of the departments at the local university to produce graphics on the fly. So. Type in the content, hit a button, and it automatically formats it. So that's what I use most of the time. How, when that doesn't uh, meet the needs, then I'll typically just use Photoshop. And then photo the Photoshop graphics will be overlaid on some kind of animated background, whether that be a uh, lower third that flies in or just a, a looping um, seamless background behind the graphics. So that's what I use most of the time. Uh, for sporting events, I have my own software that knows how to handle sports scores and makes it easy to, to change those and things like that. So, but mostly I use my own software. Um, I've used Casper CG a few times. The big problem with that one is it's got a really steep learning curve. So if you haven't used it before, it may take a, a while to come up to speed. Okay, so Diego, big fan. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, so Tinder, when will you release your data copying and graphic software? Uh, the graphic software, I'm never gonna release that one. I'll just be quite honest on that one. It's not, the user interface is not uh, friendly, user friendly, so um, and it's not not clean. And also, it, there's a bunch of things that I think it needs to do that it doesn't. So, for for example, handling alpha transparently, uh, transparency natively, it doesn't do that. And if I was gonna, if I was gonna release a piece of software like that, I'd want to redo it and do it do it properly. So, and in terms of the data copying software, again, it's user interface issue. So. Okay, Aaron answering Satinder's question, second small switcher. Yeah, something using remote NDI source during the move. So something, yeah, I don't know how else you'd, you'd, you'd do that. 
Okay, so let's see. I'm getting way, way behind here. So, so Tinder, which fiber cable do you recommend? Um, I, I sort of bounce around between different fiber cables. Uh, recently, I've been bu buying most of them from FS.com. Uh, they seem to be fairly high-quality cables. they got a nice rugged jacket on them, um, a little more beefy than some of the ones I've gotten off eBay. So I'll probably keep continue using them moving into the future. Okay. New. So it's hard, hard for me to read the screen with, under, with all the light I'm under here. Navman Bards, is that? Okay. What is your opinion on using vMix for switching and replay? Um, if it works for you, great. Um, I elected to not go with a software-based solution because those software-based solutions definitely have more latency in them than a hardware-based solution. And a lot of the times that we're doing stuff, we need to do iMag, so putting a, a video up on a projector. And the, that additional, between the delay in the camera, the delay in the switcher, and the delay in the projector, that little extra bit added by the the software switching is noticeable. So uh, th that could push you past past the point of where people are able to notice that there's a delay there. Um, so anyway, I I, pref I prefer hardware switchers myself. Uh, in terms of replay, uh, I haven't used theirs. I've watched plenty of videos on it, so I'm kind of familiar with how it works. Uh, the big issue there is, for me, it's limited to four sources. So. Um, I want my replay solution to be able to handle more than that, and vMix just doesn't, so uh, kind of limitation. If you're okay with being able to only handle four sources, then it should work just fine. So, Okay. So, let's see. So, Tinder, do you optimize your settings for Chroma using the little slider on the ATEM software? I always get the Chroma 90% there, but not as good as I want. Uh, I haven't done a whole lot of Chroma with my ATEM. Um, it's not really designed as a great chroma keying solution. Um, but, yeah, you start with the slider and then manually tweak the numbers um, uh, after after you've gotten in the right ballpark. The chroma is notoriously difficult to get right, especially if your, your, back, your green screen, your, back, your background, uh, is not properly lit. And having that background lit evenly is... is uh, Real is really important in order to make sure a key works well, and also controlling the spill. Um, that's that's hard as well. So, um, okay. Let's see, Squire player. I know you put a compressor on your mobile rig. How can you explain how to properly set a compressor? I'm not supposed to squish the peaks so that your audio is more even. But as far as settings go. Um, <laughs> Little, probably a little more complicated than I can get into on a live stream, but basically uh, the way I'd set mine, turn down the threshold so that during normal normal audio levels, it just barely starts to kick in. Uh, and then at that point, I choose a ratio based on the type of content. Like for, for, for spoken voice, I usually choose a, choose a ratio about four to one. Um, Different instruments, like if you have an instrument that has a lot of imp high high level impacts, like a drum or something like that, then um, you may choose a higher setting, but and then the attack. And I don't have a great guideline for how to set the attack. Just kind of adjust the attack so that the sound of the, so that the sound of the source isn't really affected. And then the release, depending on the content. If it's musical content, I usually set the release so that it's about the length of one beat. Uh, if it's uh, spoken content, I'll usually set it at like a half a second. Um, so that's kind of a rough guideline. Again, I could spend a whole video talking about that, but compressors are awesome. It's they're really an essential key tool for for making sure the audio levels stay in check. So I actually use multiple compressors in the trailer. So each of the individual audio channels on my mixer has a compressor. Uh, not just has a compressor. I actually use the compressor on every channel, and then I run the master output of the mixer into a into a six-channel multi-band compressor in order to really maintain those levels uh, nice and healthy. Um, so, yeah, again, I could do a whole video on that. Compressors are awesome. I'm sure there's tons of videos on YouTube already, so if you want to look it up, you can probably find something there. Let's see. Yeah, Aaron's saying the same thing. Good com good guidelines on setting compressors. Uh, let's see. So Tinder asking how I asked to handle intercom on the mobile mixer rack. So the Television Studio HD actually has intercom features built right into it. And so all I have to do at, for the director is plug in a, a headset. It uses the aviation style. So I plug in a headset there. And then in terms of the cameras, um, I'll take the SDI outputs 
and inputs of the switcher run those two optical fiber units, the optical fiber converters. And then from there, I, optical fiber cables to the Blackmagic camera converters and then plug in headsets there and that gives me intercom tally uh, return video feed so really slick solution makes it really easy I don't have to have any external I don't have to have any separate equipment um, with with at the uh, at the side of the switcher it's because the feature is just built right in so there's some limitations there like you don't have a lot of control over the audio mix for that uh, but uh, but it does work so yeah it's a simpler solution than trying to do uh, trying to do some of the, the uh, dedicated intercom systems. So I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the traditional intercom systems that are out there, the RTS and the Quircom. The audio quality on them is just not that great. And I know they're really well entrenched and you find them everywhere, but sound quality is just kind of mediocre. So, yeah. Okay, so Satinder asking how my graphics software utilizes the, this, whether it utilizes the media players. No, it does as not. Uh, so my software just outputs a video feed uh, or the HDMI output of the computer, and then I use a Luma key in order to key it, and that actually works really well for most things. So, all right. Uh, so it never ends. Hey, good old friend Doug there. So, uh, so hey, how's it going? All right. Uh, either I'm caught up, or I need to scroll more. Oh, actually, or I'm actually caught up. So, um, okay, going back to something that I started talking about at the very beginning of the video. I, like I know you guys are uh, have not been seeing as many videos from me in 2019 as I've released in the past, and I want to release more videos. It's just I've got so many things going on. My Crew Access website is taking up more than full time. It's more than a full time job with all the development I'm putting into it. Um, I'm, a, I'm releasing new features on the site almost weekly, major features on the site almost weekly. So within just in, within the last week, I've added travel capability, so it keeps track of your flights, your hotel, your your uh, uh, car rentals, and so forth. Um, also, this year I put in a full customer relationship manager, so um, it keeps me pretty busy. Uh, my amount of video stuff I'm doing is more or less the same as what it has been. With I'm doing a few more smaller events, but. Uh, so yeah, still roughly four or five days a month doing video related stuff, and then um, and then filling the rest of my time with software development, which very much these days includes the Crew Access website. So, all right, Spencer Powell. So how are you liking the TF1? A few months after, uh, a few months in, uh, I actually have the TF3, not the TF1. Um, but I really, really, really like the mixer. It works really well. Um, a few minor little complaints here and there. Uh, I wish the the channels had a delay. You, you could actually add a dot dial in a delay into each channel. It does not do that. Uh wish you, you could rat reroute Dante signals within from within the mixer. Yep, but I have to use the Dante controller in order to do that. I've had a few issues where the head amp control doesn't want to work over Dante going to the uh, TO 1608 rack unit. Um Inevitably, I'm always, always able to make it work, but uh, yeah, there's there's a few times I have to power cycle the mixer or the stage box once or twice in order to get the head amp control to work. So that part that part's a little buggy, um, but for the most part, I really do like the mixer. Um, touch screen can be a little bit slow to respond, but it's better than some of the other mixers I've used, so I can, I'm not going to complain too too much, but. Uh, uh, generally speaking, I've been quite happy with the TF3, and I think the quality of the audio of my productions has, has dramatically increased since I got that. So, so yeah. Looks like Aaron has to go. So thanks, Aaron, for watching. It's always good to have you on board. Um, so anyway, um, so yeah, TF3 has been a great mixer. I really enjoyed having it. Uh, I. W Sometimes wish I had more than one, to be quite honest. Uh, I've considered getting a TF1 in addition to the TF3, putting Dante. In. Um, like for example, I've got I've got an event this Saturday where I'm sh um, having to provide audio as well as as video, and I'm going to be using my TF3, but I can't use my my trailer there, so I'm going to have to pull the TF3 out, and I really don't like having to do that because inevitably they get banged up, scratched up, and plus uh, it's not uncommon to reconnect it improperly and have signals cross where you shouldn't have them and whatever so um, okay 
All right, so Mitchell asking if my ATEM has been a reliable switcher. And what other switchers have I used? Um, so my ATEM switcher has been quite reliable. It has one little quirk. It's never been a real problem, but when I when I first turn it on, when it's cold, the occasionally the super source doesn't seem to want to sync properly. Um, I've, I've always been able to resolve it by flipping it off and flipping it back on again. Other than that, I've never had a single problem with it. It's just been absolutely rock solid. Uh, the other switchers I've used, I haven't I haven't used a whole lot of other switchers uh, since I started doing high def video production back in the standard def days. Uh, I'd used a number of different ones, uh, Echo Lab, um, Panasonic, uh, who else? The Data Video? I can't remember. It's been a while. Been too been, been too long. Um, Echo Lab was my favorite, but that was also really pricey. Um, I forget the name of the one that I... I occasionally get hired to work for other companies, and there was one. There's kind of a company I did some work for a couple months back. I forget which type, type of switcher they had, and I did not like that one at all. It was awkward, and I talked to the guy who owns it, and he didn't like it either. He was considering ditching it for for an ATEM as well. Um, it was a higher end unit, broadcast picks. It was broadcast. It was broadcast pick switcher. So, uh, yeah, he didn't like it at all, and I didn't. I didn't like the user interface on it. It was just awkward to to use. So, um, yeah. Okay, so Tinder, you have any significant setup that includes batteries, cameras on camera lights, etc. Radio charging methods. I have so many different batteries to keep track of, and it sucks. So um, it's not uncommon for me to run cameras on battery. Um, I keep a whole pile of these Sony's, uh, Sony batteries. I use different brands. Like this is this is a, there's a Wasabi, there's a uh, Numawa. I guess that's how you say that. Uh, they work relatively well. So that handles the cameras, and my LCD monitors actually use the same type of batteries. Uh, the camera converters themselves have built-in batteries. Uh, I've gotten easily gotten three, four hours out of those. If I need to run longer, they run off 12 volts, so I can choose a, a lead acid cell. Um, that same battery can power the monitor as well, because the batteries tend to have 12 volt inputs. Uh, so that's handled most of the needs that I have. Uh, oh, my, my wireless system also uses the same style battery, so I'm able to get away with basically just one type of battery. Uh, I have, well, let me pull this out. I have a battery charger that's permanently hooked up inside the trailer. This one's from Watson. Um, so it, it can handle with interchangeable plates, in fact one of them popped off there. Uh, it, it can handle di different batteries from different different uh, manufacturers. So, and this is always plugged in in the trailer. It does it charges relatively quickly. Um, can run off either AC power or 12 volt, either one. Um, and I just always leave that hooked up. And at any given time, I have probably 30 of these batteries ready to go. And so, um, if I'm doing an event where battery is an issue, I'll have a runner that will run batteries to and from cameras, and will coordinate uh, the time to swap the batteries out so that. Um, we're not having don't have it happen. Don't have a battery die during a live shot. So that's kind of the way I've handled it. It's worked wor worked really well. I haven't had any, any major issues with that. So I have a, a battery charging area inside the trailer. I don't think I've ever really shown that on camera. But there's a shelf here dedicated just to charging batteries. So. Um, so the Ethernet port on the back of my ATEM is slightly loose and can just be pulled out uh, enough to where it loses connection. What can you do? Um, <laughs> if it's in warranty, have Blackmagic rep repair it for you. If it's not in warranty and you feel handy with a soldering iron, uh, pull it apart and it's most likely your solder connections have come loose. And it, even if they haven't, you can probably replace the Ethernet port itself. I don't. I generally don't think people use surface mount parts. You, you find a replacement part that's got all the same specs, unlike DigiKey or Mauser, and swap it out. So, yeah. So, Jamie asking what I use for a live replay. Uh, <laughs> this is one of those ongoing questions that people keep asking me. I don't do a lot of sporting events, and so my solution is not fully baked. It's still a work in progress. Uh, but it's, it's basically based on 
HyperDeck Studio minis, and then a piece of software that I wrote that controls them. Um, so it works well enough. The downside to that solution is that it can't record and play at the same time. So uh, for for sporting events where there's breaks, for example, like American football, where you have they they do a play and then they take a break while the player is moving and everything like that. That works well enough because you can stop, play your replay, and then start recording again. For for things that happen that that happen continuously, like a soccer game or football to the rest of the world, um, that's a little harder because they don't really stop and they just keep going. But uh, the the reason I went with that is like scalability. I can put as many HyperDeck Mini Studio Minis as I want in in here, and it also does 4K. Most of the replay solutions out there don't do 4K, and between those two, those are the reasons that I decided to go with my own instead of doing something off the shelf. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if if there was a better 4K solution out there that was scalable, I would consider it seriously consider doing that because I don't necessarily in. Uh, enjoy having to do s custom software in order to do things that shouldn't require that but uh, um, so that's that's kind of where we're at you know like I did it out of necessity more than uh, really wanting to do it so that software is really really in early super early stages uh, it only does a tiny fraction of what I want it to do it's uh, more or less enough to start and stop the recorders and then I don't see it. Oh, there it is. Control it with this guy. So, playback and then individual frame jog. Uh, and then the buttons up here used to toggle which, which channels are turned on and off. And then the buttons up here are used to uh, mark your insertion points. And the points where things are interesting are happen happening. So, all right. Uh, so Jinder asking what DB fiber cable do you need? Um, well, you want to keep your 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 loss to an absolute minimum. So the lower loss, the better. Um, so the more critical thing in choosing fiber setup is uh, making sure that your SFPs are have the appropriate power level. Now the the lowest power ones that I've seen typically found are designed for 10 kilometers. Uh, you don't want to have a Let's say an 80 kilometer one going over a 200 meter cable that will just overload the receiver so you want to make sure that you know if your if your cable runs are always going to be under 10 kilometers just go with your 10 kilometer SFPs so okay Anton you promised to build a replay software if if you do I'll I'll buy it I don't know when I'm going to have time to fin finish that I've got so many other projects going on you know, as it at, to, be, to be totally honest, my workload is such that I'm working well over 100 hours every week. Um, so I don't have much, by the way, of spare time to work on projects that are not absolutely critical at any given point in time. So I don't know when I'm going to get to to finishing that one. So if you want a solution anytime soon, you may need to look elsewhere. Unfortunately, so. All right, uh, 10.43 a.m., so. Okay, so never ends. You use a tool to measure bandwidth between devices. Um, I wrote, I <laughs> you guys are going to laugh, but I actually wrote my own once upon a time. I haven't had to do that for a long time, so I haven't even used my own software to do that for, gosh, years. Um, yeah, I don't, the only bandwidth... I've had to worry about for a long time is internet bandwidth and the uh, DSL reports website speed test tool works really well for that. Um, so, yeah. I, in terms of like local network, it's most for most part Ethernet is either it works or it doesn't. You don't necessarily have. The only only real problem there you have is potential contention with other devices that are sharing a leg. Um, so, yeah, bandwidth, network bandwidth hasn't been a problem for me for a long time. So, Tinder asking, do people actually run 10 kilometer on a single cable? Uh, yeah, it does happen. It's mm -hmm. typically that's typically what you'd find more between the, from, from building to building, like if you're going from one mm -hmm. campus to another, or other multiple locations on a single campus. Uh, but yes, people do people do do that a uh, fair amount. And that's one of the reasons that they have SFPs that are rated for 
80 kilometers and, and more. Uh, so, yes, it, it can happen. Uh, but 10 kilometers is kind of the starting point for the power level uh, for most of the SFPs that are out there. So, um, yeah, so uh, I think what I'm going to do here is like when I don't have questions, I'm just going to talk about my website a little bit more. So, uh, uh, there's a lot of new features that are coming. Like I'm sort of moving in the direction of helping people who use my site to uh, improve the number of services that they offer their customers. So now that the features on the site are kind of more or less complete in terms of running your own business, I'm trying to extend the site in order to provide additional tools that are customer facing, like end user facing. So that's kind of been going to be my focus for the next little while. All right, it looks like uh, it never ends. Asking a moving video between PCs and NASs. Uh, generally speaking, um, the bottleneck with most NASs is the hard drives. So in that case, you could use just any sort of disk performance. You'd utility. Blackmagic actually has one. Uh, they use it for, it comes with, I think it's the Media Express you software. You basically select the drive and then do tests and it'll tell you how fast the drive is. Uh, so you can use that if, if that's that's a concern. Um, so, Alright, Spencer Powell asking what PTZ, ca PTZ cameras I use. I use the Sony SRG300SE. Uh, I selected that camera for a couple of reasons. Like number one, it's got 30 times optical zoom, so you can really punch in without having to go into digital zoom. Uh, the other reason I selected that camera is because it has ultra, ultra, ultra slow motion capability. Most of the PTZ cameras that are out there are designed for security purposes, not for video production, and so their movements tend to be fast and jerky. The 300 SE. Uh, it, can, it can move as slow as 0.1 degrees per second. And so even when you're zoomed in 30 times, that can still give you a relatively slow pan. Uh, so the primary, that's the primary reason I went with the camera. Now, with that said, the cam that camera is not great in low light. It really needs a lot of light to give it a high quality image. So um, especially when you zoom in, because uh, as the more you zoom in, the more you're uh, your aperture effectively closes down. It doesn't physically close down, but the less light you get because you're zooming. Uh, so if you're far away in a low-light environment, those images can get quite noisy. Um, moving up from there, you get into some high-dollar stuff. Like the, the BTZ that I'd love to have, uh, Sony X1000, I believe is the model number. And it's a uh, retail suggested price, MSRP. Is about eleven thousand dollars. Street price is more like eight thousand. So, nice thing about that, it has basically the same image sensor in it as the Sony X70 and Z Z150 that I use. So it would match really well, but price is preventing me from getting those. So anyway, uh, so Tinder asking if I have any experience with remote heads that aren't PTZ system. Um, not a lot. I've I've used a couple of the what, the cheaper ones out there. And if you want it, if you want one that's actually going to be usable for motion during a shot, you're going to be spending a lot of money. Like you, you could buy a car with the amount of money that the good PTZ heads uh, cost. So that's why I went the PTZ camera because they're quite a bit more more affordable in quotes. So. Okay, so Matt asking if I've used Wi-Fi for ATM software control, um, not being a, so anything not other than the direct Ethernet connection. I tried it early on when I first got my ATEM switchers. I got my first ATEM switcher, and it was not good. It was the connection was completely unreliable. I know some people have some luck with it. A lot of it depends on what uh, access point, Wi-Fi access point you're using. I hear the Apple ones are good, but Fire, fire, if I understand right, they don't make those anymore. Um, I haven't, I haven't heard of any others that are considered reliable. So, um, but based on my experience trying to use Wi-Fi in a production environment, I would say don't do it. I'd say always go hardline Ethernet. I have had 
more situations than I can count where Wi-Fi has been unreliable and has been a real problem. So avoid Wi-Fi. My advice would be to avoid Wi-Fi at all costs. Uh, and if you, if you really want to use an iPad or something like that in order to control a switcher, you can make Ethernet adapters work with those. So you get a, a camera connection kit to give you a USB and then a USB to Ethernet adapter. And then you can plug in your cable there. But Wi-Fi just is not a reliable way to go. Um, you may have better luck doing like a remote desktop connection to an actual PC that's hooked up with Ethernet. But even then, the Wi-Fi is just not a great great technology to try and use in a production environment. So, uh, let's see. So then they're saying it uses the basic Wi-Fi router from Amazon and then a ubiquity access point. Works great for a convention center, hotel, ballroom. That's great when you get that to work. Um, tell you the main problem, relying on that. I have worked in at least three environments that I can think of where their own wireless network intentionally interferes and tries to shut down any other Wi-Fi access, Wi-Fi networks that are in the building. I um, had one f a few months ago where I was trying to control an audio mixer by Behringer, uh, and I brought my own access point. I wasn't even trying to use the built-in Wi-Fi in, in, in their mixer, and the building actively shut down my access point. And any time any, any my, one of my devices would connect, their network would send a disconnect, drop signal connection to that device. And so I couldn't maintain a connection more than about one, two seconds tops. So I would, don't rely on Wi-Fi. It's basically the bottom line. So, um, let's see. So you hear to record, it does have a video on the remote head. I forget the name of that one, but that, that head is, the problem with that head is it's not good for trying to use for a live shot. It's decent for, for repositioning a camera between shots, but it's not good for trying to do a motion shot. So Stinder asking what wider access points I've used that give me bad Wi-Fi. I've tried a whole bunch of different brands. Uh, I've been mostly using Asus for the last couple of years. I've also tried Netgear, Linksys. I uh, forget who else. I've not tried any, any of the U Ubiquity ones, and they may be, they probably work better. But uh, yeah, so but the biggest problem with Wi-Fi is interference from from other outside sources. So okay. Yeah, so someone else, and Will, William chiming in, that setting up for your, yourself for failure with uh, with Wi-Fi, yeah. So, uh, so Chase uh, asking what access points I use in the field. Um, do they do well in a crowded RF environment? Uh, the one I use most commonly is an Asus. I've also got a Belkin little portable one that I use. Um, one of my trailer here is an Asus, a uh, higher-end one. It's uh, one that supports VLANs and multiple networks. Um, the problem has never been my access point itself. It's always been interference, like outside interference, intentional outside interference. So, okay. Um, Alexander asking about equipment I use for replay. I just covered that like just a few minutes ago, so if you can rewind the stream. Um, yeah, so it's hinder. An interference is more likely to give bad results than a basic loss of a connection. Yes. So, Wi Fi is just, and wireless in general. But particularly Wi-Fi, uh, just not as robust as we'd like them to be. There's just too much interference, too many other things going on, and especially in this day and age where everybody's got a cell phone, and those cell phones are constantly sending out Wi-Fi beacons to try and connect to any available network, uh, and that just creates a lot of interference, creates a lot of problems. Um, I used I had a situation a few years ago where I was uh, relaying videos, relaying video between multiple buildings, and we were using. Uh, access points and Wi-Fi and really nice directional antennas. Everything worked fabulously. It worked great uh, until the building was filled with people, and then we couldn't get a connection for anything. Uh, just be, all those people's cell phones were creating enough interference that made it next to impossible to get a decent, reliable Wi-Fi connection there. So, all right. Uh, 
So go another five minutes, guys. I actually have do have another appointment right after this. I'm gonna have to end right at the end, of the, right at the top, or the, the bottom of the hour there. Um, so any, if you want to get any last questions in before we go, I'll try and get those submitted in now. Um, uh, I'm planning on doing these live streams regularly, as I've kind of done in the past, probably about one every two to three months. Uh, depending on my schedule availability. And I will try and move them around different times of the day so that different parts of the world can tune in live without having to get out of bed. Uh, so according to the YouTube statistics, most most of my viewers are in the United States. Uh, UK uh, would, be, would be next. And then kind of Europe in general uh, would be next. And so that's kind of why I've done this one uh, this time in the morning. So like in Europe, they can watch it in the evening. So... Uh, let's see. So Chase asking what's next for the trailer. Um, I haven't necessarily decided what the next big project is. I'm always doing little tiny enhancements. Um, this monitor over here, I, I need to, I need to run a new, new signal for that. Um, right now it's been running off of HDMI and it's been very unreliable. So I'm going to be doing an SDI connection for that. Um, I've got more audio upgrades for the front wall here. I don't know if I've shown you guys that. Um, a while back, I added a little audio mixer up front um, in order to give me, allow me to merge audio from different sources. Uh, and that was a project that took a little while. I had to run new audio lines throughout the, so throughout the trailer. So I'll, I'll probably continue that project. It's not totally done. I want to do more with the intercom there. I don't know. So, um, so anyway. Um, Fury, Furs, Fury, Fury's PJ. I don't know how you say that. Uh, will I be attending NAB? Yes, I will be there. I should be there. That's the plan. Um, planning on being there Monday, Tuesday. If you do happen to run into me, see me, say hi. Uh, it's always nice to meet people. See, uh, they're, they're watching the channel. I put some faces to the names. So, um, okay, let's see. Matt asking where I announce live streams. Uh, just on YouTube, actually. Uh, this, this, I scheduled this stream two days ago, and I set it to start reminding people to, for two days in advance. So it should have appeared in your on your subscriptions page for the last two days. Um, other than that, I don't. I probably should use social media a little more. I do have Twitter and Instagram accounts set up for the company. Both of them are DJP underscore video. I should probably use those to make announcements about that stuff. So... Um, anyway, so yeah, it's, and YouTube should have been reminding people. Okay. Okay, Dally, Dally Graffy, whatever, how you say that? Can you shoot long stream video, uh, part, everyday party or conference with mir mirrorless like a DS, uh, like a GH5? It's probably not recommended. Those cameras really aren't designed for long term shooting like that. Your better bet would be a consumer camcorder. Uh, the Sony AX53 or AX33 would be really good choices for that. Uh, they're designed to run all day, every day. Uh, so they work really well for that kind of thing. Okay, Chase, thanks for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, William, wh where can we find specs for your full setup or partial setup? I have a lot of information on my website about uh, the trailer and equipment list and things like that. So djprod.biz. Uh, you may have to dig a little bit to find some of it, but it's there's a lot of stuff there. So, okay, um, oh, I'm, I'm, I skipped one. I'm going to use a Sony X7, X70 camera wirelessly with an ATEM. You recommend any small form wireless solutions. Uh, the Cinegears, Ghost Eye stuff works fairly well. Um, depending on your frame rate, if you stay under 60 frames per second, the IDX CW1 works fairly well, and it's pretty inexpensive. Um, that might even work at 60 frames per second. I haven't tried. I haven't tried that particular model. I have the I have the next model up, the CW3, and it doesn't like 60 frames per second. But that's a, that's a over SDI. HDMI may, may work better on the CW1. Uh, the thing about the, the wireless solutions that are kind of in the, that segment of the market, they're all based on the same core equipment, and so for the most part, they're going to perform more or less the same. So as long as you find one that's got decent antennas. And as the form factor you want, and just kind of go with it. So, um, let's see. Let's 
So Jonathan Scruggs asked, he mentioned that he picked up a ATM switcher and no other way to control the ATM switchers via TCP. So similar to the way you do Telnet with the Hyperdex. Um, from what I understand, the ATM uses UDP and uh, Skarhoy, S-K-A-A-R-H-O-J, has some, some software that you can download uh, in order to control the, the switchers. So, um, so yeah, um, you can you can go go get that software from them. So, okay, so Tinder using Hyperdex, uh, Hyperdex protocol for, for protocol for a streamer for the replay system. Yes, that's how it works. So, uh, William still using the PD one seventy for live stream. Wow, that's that's an old camera. I, I have a VX two thousand. I still have it actually. It's similar, very similar. All right, so without using a video hub, is there a good SDI splitter somewhere to four way out? One, eight, one. There's, there's quite a few of them out there. Uh, I, I've been using the Blackmagic one. It's called SDI Distribution. I get the 4K version of it. Um, works okay. Works fine. Um, the, the big problem with the uh, the, the uh, Blackmagic uh, mini converters is the power supplies. The power supplies tend to go out a lot. So I may consider getting a, differ, a different power supply, just 12 volt. Uh, 5.5 slash 2.5 millimeter. Um, on lights, blah blah blah. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Th some of those cameras can operate in preview mode for a long time, but th th those large, high-resolution sensors really aren't made for continuous use. So you're better off getting a camcorder. Yeah, so Tanner mentioned. This, yeah, this, let's say the, the wireless have the same chips. That's true. Uh, a company called Amamom. Am 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 can't say that word. Amemon. There you go. So, yeah. Uh, Anton asked me if I ever build and terminate my own fiber cable. No, I do not. I do not have the, I don't, I don't have the equipment, nor do I intend to get it. Uh, proper fiber termination unit. I looked into it. The prices tend to hover around $6,000. So, it's just not worth it. I, c I can throw away a whole bunch of fiber cables for a whole lot less money. And so, that's kind of what I've done. So, I've uh, Basically, what I do if I have trouble trouble with a fiber cable, I toss it and get a new one. You know, I'm only paying twenty or thirty bucks for most of my fiber cables, so it's just not worth the, worth the time and effort to try and try and repair them. So, anyway, um, I I do need to be wrapping up. I have another thing going on here in just a few minutes, uh, so I need to go. But appreciate you guys watching. If you have any questions, uh, you can leave those in the uh, c comment section down below, and I'll try and respond. Uh, you can also contact me via my website, djprod.biz. There's a contact us link down at the bottom of the page, and I usually get back to you pretty quick if you send me. I, I do ask that you keep the questions rather short, so I do have a lot going on, and so that's something that requires a long response. It's probably just not, not, that's probably not the right venue. Um, if, if, you're, if you have not checked out my crew access website, c-r-e-w-a-x-i-s.com, uh, Please do. It's a website built specifically for managing the type of businesses that we're all running. So, and there are plans uh, ranging from free all the way up to corporate enterprise level. Uh, ask, maintain, help, help you run all aspects of your business. So, uh, billing, building events, hiring crew, keeping track, keeping track of your finances, um, keeping track of your contacts and maintaining your relationships with them, keeping track of your equipment. There are all, sor all sorts of in interesting, fun stuff there. So uh, go give it a try. Appreciate it. Anyway, thanks, guys, and we'll talk to you later.